Welcome to School of Bible Believers, Lesson 13H. In Lesson 13, we've been learning how to study the Bible, and we're doing just getting a, a King James Version, and uh, Lana's been picking a chapter from different sections of the Bible, and then I don't know it in advance. She just tells it to me the same time you hear it. And that way I don't have any prep time. That way you can see if you're getting a chapter of the Bible, this is how I would study it, how I'd learn information from it. I've got this uh, Bible Pro program where it's good. Any, you know, BibleGateway.com or anything where you can look up verses, uh, words is good. I like using the computer program because then you can look up phrases. And this one you can specifically limit it to certain books of the Bible. And looking up phrases is good for finding your cross-references. So today, this is our last one in Lesson 13. Woo this is uh, Hebrews through Revelation. Anna has picked a chapter in there, and we're going to cover that. So what chapter did you pick? And while you're doing that, let me go get something. I picked the book of Revelation, chapter 1, Go figure. And chapter 10. John eats the book. John eats the book. Wow. Mmm, tasty. Uh, edible book. Mm. Revelation 10. Uh, the one thing I got I wanted to tell everybody about. This is a website. I'll put it in the description of the video. The website is www.openbible.info info slash labs labs slash cross hyphen references c r o s s hyphen r e f e r e n c e s and this site you can put in any verse you want and it will give you the cross references um, the bad thing is it gives it to you in ESV but then there's a link at the top and you can click on KJV and then you can see they'll bring up those references in Bible Gateway. Um, Cross-referencing is how God teaches you the scriptures. And so that was a, a tool I just learned about I thought I'd share. It's www.openbible.info slash labs slash cross hyphen references. Okay, so we're studying Revelation chapter 10. Okay. Uh, when we're in Revelation, I'll get the context. We're in the Israel's program. This is end time events for Israel's program. So it's not the dispensation of grace. These are things that primarily happen in the tribulation period. Uh, but then you've also got millennial reign, second coming um, after that. So Revelation chapter 10. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. Okay, so it's a mighty angel. He comes down from heaven. He's got a cloud. A rainbow. A rainbow should remind us of the promise that God made to... Noah, that he would never destroy the earth with a flood. Uh, his face was as it were the sun. Well, that's a, a good um, description of Jesus Christ. You know, he has his face shining. A cross-reference given here for me on that one is Matthew 17, 2. And I know Matthew 17 refers to the transfiguration. It says that Jesus was transfigured before them and his face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as the light. Another time when a face shines is when Moses sees the glory of God. He had been given the law and he comes down from the mount and his face shone. They couldn't look at him. He had to put the veil over his face. So really, when a face shines like that, it's really a reference to the glory of God. Uh, so then it says also his feet as pillars of fire. I've got cross-reference here of Revelation 1, 15 and 16. I know that's a description of Jesus Christ. 
So if you go to Revelation 1, 15, uh, you've got in verse 13, in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. Well, that's what we found from uh, Revelation 10, verse 1, his feet as pillars of fire. Uh, then uh, verse, uh, his voice as the sound of many waters, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. So the description of the angel in Revelation 10 is a lot like the description of Jesus Christ. You see that in Revelation 1 and verse 15, his feet like unto fine brass as if they burned in a furnace. Well, the furnace there would be a type of going through fiery trials. Brass is a type of judgment in the Bible. Um, and of course, the shining face like the sun is uh, like the glory of God. Uh, for the rainbow that you see in Revelation 10, if you go over to Revelation 4, I believe it is, uh, the, it looks like they're referencing verse 3 in a cross-reference. Uh, yeah, that's what I was looking at, or looking for. In Revelation 4, uh, verse 2, And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one set on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. So there's your rainbow. Uh, the one sitting on the throne, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, if you go over to Genesis to see about the rainbow that I had mentioned before, Genesis chapter, looks like chapter 9. Verse 12, Genesis 9, 12. And God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow, that's the rainbow, in the cloud. It's in a cloud. And it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. Okay, so now going back to Revelation 10. When you see a mighty angel, it doesn't specifically identify the angel, um, who he is. Uh, just based on the description and everything we have here, I believe it is a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is called the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. Um, he is really, of course, greater than angels. I mean, he's God, but uh, he takes on many forms. And just based on this description, I would say this is the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't have to be. It could be some other angel, but that's probably who it is. And so, Revelation 10, 1, you see the angel. He comes down from heaven. He's clothed with a cloud and a rainbow upon his head. So that tells us that, um, of course, Revelation and where we are, there's judgment coming. But it tells us that there's basically the rainbow and then the cloud tells us there's mercy in the judgment because the rainbow is a symbol of God. He judged Noah, uh, not judged Noah, but the people in Noah's day with the flood destroyed them. Jesus says in Matthew 24, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And so it's not a coincidence that you've got a rainbow here. The rainbow is before the throne in Revelation 4. It's a reminder that although God is pouring out His wrath upon the earth for their, uh, their wickedness, and He's also refining Israel at the same time, there is mercy in this. And that's what the rainbow and the cloud is there for. Uh, his face shining as the sun shows glory, the glory of God. His feet as pillars of fire then, as we mentioned before, would be a reference to the brass being the judgment. And he has come through the fire. 
having uh, lived the perfect life as the Son of Man, learned obedience, suffered uh, death on the cross. So all, this, all these pictures here then is when this... In other words, I think the reason you're given all this is to tell you that what's about to happen in Revelation 10 is, although it's in the midst of judgment, there's also mercy for the believing remnant of Israel in that judgment. If you'd been reading through um, Revelation, you just had these trumpet judgments, you know, in verse, chapter 9, verse 14, the, you had the sixth angel with the trumpet. You had the six vile judgments, in, well, seven vile judgments starting in Revelation 6. Then you have the seven uh, trumpet judgments starting in Revelation 8, 2. And you've gotten through six of the trumpet judgments and then there's a little pause in here for chapters 10 and 11 and 12 and 13 and 14 and then in 15 you get to the seven vile judgments. So basically you're over halfway through the tribulation period and you've seen all these judgments come and it's like God is uh, going to show that he doesn't, he's not just pouring out his wrath. I mean, if God wanted to wipe out the earth, he could have just done it, you know, snapped his fingers and phew, gone. Uh, the whole purpose of the tribulation period is to save Israel. And so in the midst of these judgments, you see God's mercy. Okay, Revelation 10, 1. So that's uh, based upon what we see there. It's Jesus Christ and it's uh, judgment, but it's also God's mercy there. Uh, verse 2 and he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot on the earth. Um, you know that that is a mighty angel. He could put a right foot on the sea and left foot on the earth. Um, but why does he do that? Well, the sea is known for uh, Satan's realm. Uh, if you look in Revelation thirteen, verse one. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Uh, then look over in Revelation 17, verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. So there's the Babylonian religious system sitting upon many waters. In Revelation 13, the beast or the Antichrist comes out of the sea. Uh, so when you see, um, in, back in Revelation 10 too, when you see the mighty angel set his right foot upon the sea, it's, it's like he's covering Satan's domain there. And then he puts his left foot on the earth. Well, Satan is the god of this world, uh, 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says. And... His rule is, is at its peak during this time, during the Antichrist rule. Um, the height of Satan's policy of evil is seen uh, during this time. So um, Satan's realm of the sea has come upon the earth. And the fact that he then sets his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth shows that basically he's over it. I mean, if you stand on something, it's showing that you're above it. You know, you're, it's beneath you. You, you have rulership over it. So even though Satan is you know, associated with the beast coming out of the sea, the great whore upon many waters, and he's got this peak policy of evil going, the uh, lie program going at this time, the fact that this angel puts his foot, one on the sea, one on the earth, shows that even in this time, God is still in control. It's like he is above the things of Satan, is what that's telling you. And the little book... Um, the little book we're going to get to later on in the chapter. Uh, so there's more details about the little book, so we'll skip that for now. Uh, verse 3, And cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Okay, as a lion roareth. We'll go back to chapter 5, because... Um, the seven seal judgments, the tribulation period begins with this book that has uh, seven seals on it. And no one can open the book. And in Revelation 5.5 5 it says, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, 
Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. So uh, Jesus Christ is, you see lion there is capitalized. Jesus Christ is of the tribe of Judah. He is the, the lion. He is the root of David. Um, by the time you get to Revelation, you should already know that stuff. So he doesn't go into detail there. But the capitals, the capital letters there tell you that. So when you see in Revelation 10, 3, that someone cries with a loud voice as when a lion roareth, um, they already said the mighty angels, probably Jesus Christ, based upon the description of verse 1. And when he cries as a lion, uh, that's really the judgment that he's bringing upon the earth. He's also seen in the book of Revelation as the lamb. Well, the lamb isn't someone who comes and judges. A lion is the king of the jungle. He's the king. He comes and he can judge. A lamb is just slaughtered. Um, so at his first coming, Jesus was the lamb. In the second coming, he's the lion. So when he cries, as a, when a lion roareth, then that means that um, he's, this is his judgment, basically. And it says, when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Uh, thunder is, really means the voice of God. You look in John chapter 12. Again, there's a lot. Let, let me say a couple things before we go on. A lot of people say Revelation is hard to understand. And one of the reasons is because you've got all this, all these symbols here. Um, we saw in chapter 10, verse 1, mighty angel. And we had to look at what rainbow means and cloud and the face shining and the feet as pillars of fire to figure out it's Jesus Christ. Um, then his foot standing upon the sea and his left foot on the earth. Well, we had to look at scriptures to figure out that Satan's domain. A lion roareth. We had to look at a scripture to figure out what that means. Seven thunders. Now we got to look up a scripture to know what that means. When you get to Revelation, God assumes you've already read and understood at least basics, all the basics of Genesis through Jude. So that's why Revelation is hard to understand. He could have said uh, in chapter 10, verse 1, And I saw Jesus Christ come down from heaven with mercy for Israel, with the glory of God on his face, and judgment for the nations. And he put his feet upon Satan's domain and cried out in judgment. That's a summary of the first three verses um, in plain English. But none of that's there. You don't, because what God does is, uh, Proverbs 25, 2 says, it's the wisdom of God to conceal a thing. When Jesus spoke in, par uh, spoke in parables, the disciples asked him over in Matthew 13, well, why are you speaking in parables? He never did this before. And he says in Matthew 13, verse 11, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. In other words, you disciples, you've believed me. And because you believe God and his word, I'll give you greater revelation. But if you don't believe me, you don't deserve to know the things of God. And so I'm going to conceal the things of God from people who don't believe. And I'm going to make the things of God clear for those who do believe. And that's why he spoke in parables. And that's why there's this symbology, uh, things that are hard to be understood in the book of Revelation. If you believe God and his word, then you understand what these things mean by the time you get to Revelation because you've already spent hours and hours reading God's Word and researching and figuring out Genesis through Jude. So that when you get to Revelation, it's hard to understand, but it's not really hard if you've learned all the other stuff. The problem is Christians don't want to take the time to read all the other stuff, and they say, oh, I want to know what happens at the end. And they read Revelation, and they look at mighty angel, rainbow, face as the sun, little book. What in the world is all this talking about? And then they just put it on a shelf and they go to get a commentary or listen to somebody and let them tell them what it, is, what it means. Um, God makes it hard for those. It's, what's the saying? It's a simple for a child to understand. What is it? Oh, um, the Bible is... Oh, wait a minute. Now you put me on the yeah. spot. I'm and sorry. Wait, no, no, no. It's, I, I it's get the it. scholars it. that it, can't understand The Bible it. is deep enough 
that scholars will drown in it, yet shallow enough that a child can swim in it. There you go. That's what's going on in Revelation 10. If you have childlike faith, you can understand it. But if you approach it as scholarly, scholarly from man's point of view, you'll get lost. Okay, so the seven thunders uttered their voice. Uh, let's look over in John chapter 12 about the thunders. Uh, let's see, in John chapter 12. Uh, okay, Jesus says in verse 28, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people therefore that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spake to him. Thunder in your Bible is meaning the voice of God basically. You think of God, you know how big he is. When he came upon the mountain in Hebrews, um, we're told that the mountain shook. It was a smoke on the mountain and it shook. And the people of Israel said, I exceed, or Moses said, I exceedingly tremble and quake. And you had the people of Israel saying, don't let God speak to us. It's in Hebrews 12. It says, um, verse 18, For you are not come unto the mouth that might be touched, and that burn with fire, nor unto blackness and darkest, darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more, for they could not endure that which was commanded, and it so and if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with the dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Uh, that's what happened when God spoke to Israel with the law in the book of Exodus. You know, he doesn't speak with a very you know, people say, oh, the still small voice of God. That, now, God's, God is big. He, uh, you know, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. The bigger you are, the bigger your voice is. That's just how it works. And uh, he's just got this loud voice. It's just so, they exceedingly tremble and quake, and the mountains just shake at his voice. And so, in John 12, when he speaks, I have glorified it, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. People said it thundered. So when you see in Revelation 10, verse 3, uh, that's why James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they're also called the sons of thunder. In other words, they're going to be the sons of God or the ones who proclaim God's word. Um, so when you see in Revelation 10, 3, when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices, that's meaning this is the authoritative word of God um, speaking here. Verse 4, And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. This is the only time, I believe, in the book of Revelation that John is told not to write something down. In the book of Daniel, there's a lot of things revealed to Daniel, and God says, well, let's go there and you can, you can see what he says because this will help us understand. Look at Daniel chapter 12. At the end of the book of Daniel, there's a lot of end time stuff that God has revealed to him. And a lot of that stuff really isn't, it's not written down in the book of Daniel. Daniel 12, 4 But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. So God says, I've given you a lot of information about end time events, but the people, because Daniel, you're ready to hear it, but the people of Israel as a whole can't understand this. So it's not time for people to learn all this stuff. So don't write it all down. Shut it up. And in the end, when it comes, many people run to and fro, knowledge should be increased. So we're going to give you Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, etc. And we're going to have more scripture. And then they can get more information. And then they'll be ready for the book of Revelation. They'll be ready for the details. But they're not ready yet. And knowledge will be increased later. 
Uh, so here in Revelation 10 then, in verse 4, when it says, Seal up those things which the seven thunders utter and write them not. Um, what they wrote down, everybody wants to know. The answer is, I don't know, because they were sealed up. They didn't write them down. But the reason for that must be the same as Daniel, which is people aren't ready for it yet. Uh, seven is the number of God, and or a spiritual completion, I should say. And if it thundered, it's the voice of God. So these are things that God said. And, um, you know, what it is, maybe it's too detailed, maybe it's too clear, and they don't, God's, you know, trying to conceal information from unbelievers. Uh, Satan, God didn't reveal the mystery, the dispensation of grace, until given to Paul in Acts 9. And we're told in 1 Corinthians 2 that uh, if Satan and his forces knew that the cross was God's plan all along, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So perhaps this information here, the seven thunders uttered, if it was written down, then the events wouldn't happen as God has them happen in the tribulation period. And so for the sake of God's plan being fulfilled, uh, he tells them not to write them down. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that when we get to verse 6. Oh, okay, so verse 5. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven. Okay, and then verse 6. And swear by him that liveth forever and ever. So this is a major thing. I mean, we've already identified this as Jesus Christ. Um, Titus 1, 2 says God cannot lie. Um, John 17, 17 says the word of God is truth. Jesus Christ is the word. Whatever he says, it's true. When someone, so it, in other words, the point is, God doesn't ever have to swear something to be true because it's already going to be true. You know, man, he tells lies, so then you go before a court and you swear that you'll tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Um, so you're saying, yeah, I usually lie, but this time I'm going to tell the truth and I swear that I'll tell. In other words, it's an oath. Uh, you're, um, you definitely need to tell the truth when you swear. Now, Jesus Christ, of course, being the Word of God, He always tells the truth. So He's not swearing to uh, say, oh, I've lied before, now I'm going to tell the truth. Swearing for Him just shows you the importance of it, of what He's about to say. Um, you always swear by someone higher than yourself. And the problem is, no one is higher than God. That's why you'll see... Um, book of Amos, for example, God will say, I swear by myself. Well, I don't know the exact reference, so let me look up swear by myself, and hopefully that's the exact phrase. Um, no, it's not. Um, let's look up swear. I'll just look up swear, because I know it's in Amos. I'll look up uh, swear in the book of Amos. Amos. It's not in there, okay? Um, swear, I, mean, I spelled it wrong probably. There it is. But that's not the one I'm looking for, okay? Um, so I looked up swear, S-W-A-R-E. I looked up swear, S-W-E-A-R. Um, let me look up swore. Look at that. Nope. Um... Okay, let me look up the phrase by myself. See, this is good. You can see that I don't always have the right uh, phrase here. And I'm going to look up exact phrase by myself. And I know it's in Amos. Yeah. By myself isn't in there. Um, maybe by God. Let's look that up. Nope. I'm going to start off maybe with uh, S-W. I don't know if I can look by just two letters in the book of Amos. Yeah, it does. Okay, here we go. Um, 
Well, he has sworn by his holiness in Amos 4, 2. Um, here we go, Amos 6, 8. So sworn, S-W-O-R-N, is the word that I needed to be looking at. That's why I couldn't find it. But I was able to look up S-W and get it. Amos 6, 8. The Lord God has sworn by himself, saith the Lord, the God of hosts. I abhor the excellency of Jacob and hate his palaces. Therefore will I deliver up the city with all that is therein. God cannot swear by anyone higher than himself because there is no one higher than himself, so he has to swear by himself. So, over in Revelation 10, and verse 6, Swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are. He could have just done like he said in Amos 6, 8. The Lord God has sworn by himself. Uh, but remember, these are truths that are being concealed. And so you don't really know it's Jesus unless you pick up the clues. You don't really know it's God unless you understand it. And he gives a long description of it. It's basically the Lord swearing by himself, just like in Amos 6, 8. But I think he gives you this long description to show you that he can... What he's first off swearing means this is something very important that will happen. Take note, and then by him in verse six, swear by him that liveth forever and ever. Okay, that's God, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein. So it's he swears by God, but he gives this long description to show. Um, that God has created these things, so he is the only one that has the authority to make this next statement, which is that there should be time no longer. That is a very significant statement. We've always had time uh, ever since God created man, but God is outside of time. He lives in eternity. And time has existed for six, at least 6,000 years, probably longer, and it will continue until this point when he says that time is no longer. Uh, <coughs> so, this goes back... This goes back to verse 4. Um, that I was going to get to when I got to verse 6. Seal up those things which the seven, things utter, the seven thunders uttered and write them not. Well, if right after that, right after the seven thunders utter something, and then he swears by himself that time should be no longer, then what is being talked about here is now we're jumping way ahead. We're jumping, look over in Ephesians 1. We're jumping to the point where there is no time. If he declares that time should be no longer, that's when time is no longer. There's no more time. So in Ephesians 1.10, it says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Once God has reconciled heavenly places back to himself through the body of Christ, and he's reconciled the earthly places back to himself through Israel, the bride of Christ, then God can begin the dispensation of the fullness of times. Well, if it's the fullness of times, times come to its fullness, time is no longer. So if he's standing on the... So, so whatever was uttered by the seven thunders in Revelation 10, 4, probably the reason that we're not told is because whatever is said is God's word and it probably relates to the dispensation of the fullness of times, which is way out there. And, you know, whenever you're not, whenever you're reading something in the Bible that's not pertaining to your dispensation, it's harder to understand because you're not in it. And the dispensation of the fullness of times, to my knowledge, I don't know of any instructions in the Bible that are specifically for that time. You know, what happens during that time? I don't know. Um... I assume it's here because God's word is complete and will be operating in the dispensation of the fullness of times for all eternity. So um, that those words are here somehow. We just don't have the Holy Ghost 
revealing the things for that dispensation to us yet. Um, that's hidden from us. And so it makes sense then that the seven thunders, whatever they uttered is hidden from us, so it's probably relating to the dispensation of the fullness of times. So I think the reason we're told, you may think, well, why is he talking about this? Because the context is the tribulation period. And then you get to verse 7, Revelation 10, 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound. Well, that's the seventh trumpet judgment. The seventh trumpet judgment happens in the book of Revelation. And that seventh trumpet judgment begins with the seven vile judgments, and the seven vile judgments begin in Revelation 16. So, why does God basically jump ahead to the dispensation of the fullness of times when he's really in the middle of the tribulation period? You have to get through the tribulation period, Jesus' second coming, uh, the millennial reign, and then you've got earth reconciled back to God, heaven reconciled back to God, then you're in the dispensation of the fullness of times. So why does he go way ahead like that? Um, you know, that's a good question. Um, you know, I don't have all the answers for you, but I would say the reason is because basically what he's saying to John in Revelation, uh, going back to the context, the whole chapter really, uh, and we're about to get back to it, is about this little book that opened and what's in the little book and everything. Well, the little book... Um, has some information in it that it doesn't really make sense. Like, you know, in other words, you're reading through Revelation, you've got seven seal judgments, seven trumpet judgments, seven vile judgments, all these judgments of God that are upon, and it's mainly upon Israel. And you think, well, why does God put all these judgments upon his people when he's trying to save them? It doesn't make any sense. Well, the answer is because they won't have faith in God until he actually chastises them. As Hebrews 12 says, Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth as a son. And that's the only way. God tried to bring them into the kingdom long before without punishing them. He says, I'm going to bring you out of Egypt. I'm going to put all the plagues upon Egypt. And I'm just going to bring you out. And you're not going to suffer from them. Go across the Red Sea into the Promised Land. And yet they didn't have faith. And they had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years before they would take that. Man has to, because man is so prideful in his own, if you just tell man, you know, and everything's going good, and you just tell him, oh, you're a sinner, man will say, no, I'm not. Well, God's given you the internal witness that you're a sinner and that you need to trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin. When that message is given to you, you should believe it. But most people reject it because they're so prideful. They think, I don't need God to save me. I can do it myself. Yeah, I recognize there's a God and there's a heaven, but I'll get there on my own. It's basically what man's idea is. It's his pride. And so, because man is so prideful, God ends up having to, you know, in this case with Israel, they're not saved. God called them out, called Abraham back in Genesis chapter uh, 12. And yet here it is, Revelation, um, you know, at least 3,500, 4,000 years later, and they still, the nation as a whole, has not believed God. They have to go through the fiery trials of the tribulation period before they will believe. And so I think what God is saying here, he's got this little book, and the information contained in that book is hard to believe that that's really going to save them. And so I think what God has to do then, he's, he's got to say, I'm giving you this little book, and the initial reaction would be, now wait a minute here, this isn't going to... Um, this isn't what we need. And basically God is saying, I am, you know, here's the voice of God with the seven thunders. We're not told what was uttered. We're just told that the seven thunders uttered their voice. So it must be important for us to know that seven thunders uttered their voice. The reason is that we know this is God himself speaking. Uh, Revelation, go back to Revelation 1. Here's another idea about the seven thunders. Um, Revelation 1, yeah, you've got these uh, candlesticks. 
I'm looking, there should be a phrase in here, and I'm probably just overlooking. I'm looking for the seven spirits of God. Um, so I, I don't see it. So I'm going to do a search here. Seven spirits. Uh, Revelation 3, verse 1. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Okay, so seven spirits and seven stars. The one who has that, you go back to Revelation 1. Um, we read this before, verse 13, there's the Son of Man with the seven candlesticks. Verse 16 says he had in his right hand seven stars. So there are seven spirits of God. In fact, Revelation 1, 4 John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. So those are the seven spirits of God and each one is sent. You say, I think he had seven spirits. I think it's a reference to each of the angels of the seven churches and they're mentioned in Revelation 2 and 3. So when you have um, the seven thunders uttering their voice in Revelation 10, 4, uh, there may be the reason it's seven is because it may be the seven spirits of God. It may be angels, each one representing those seven churches who end up uttering their voices. Uh, the whole point, I think, of all this is you're giving, uh, going back to Revelation 10, you've got the one within his hand is in verse 2. It says, and he had in his hand a little book open. And then you don't actually, they don't actually mention the little book again until verse 8. And so I think what the stage is set for here and what we've got in verses 2 all the way down to verse 8 is an explanation that this information in the little book is hard to believe that it is going to bring salvation for Israel. And so what God has to do then is He has to show the His authority, that this is God Himself. And He's the one who in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth he, and he says in Revelation 1 and verse 8, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Basically, these are the words that the Lord himself says. And it may be hard for you to believe that all the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven vial judgments have to take place in order for Israel to be saved. But God says, I began this in Genesis 1.1. I'm going to end it. And here I am. I'm the one who is going to declare time to be no longer. That's the end, basically, of, the, uh, of that dispensation. Dispensation of fullness of times begins. You, uh, eternity begins then. All the events have, that need to take place have taken place. So he has to set up. He's the authority. And so... Trust him because of who he is. Who is the one giving you this little book? And you can see these statements of authority. Right in verse 2, in Revelation 10, 2. He said, his right foot upon the sea and the left foot on the earth. That's God who does that. He cries as a lion roareth in verse 3. That's the lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus. He utters the seven thunders utter their voices. That's the seven spirits of God. The voice of God heard seven times there. Um, and then again, he stands in verse 5, stands upon the sea and upon the earth. And then what he says, again, it's God who does that. Stand on the sea and on the earth. And then, on top of that, what he says, he even lifts up his hand and swears by himself that what he says is true, that there should be time no longer. So this is the most significant thing here. And so um, that shows you that the little book, you can believe the words of the little book, is basically what all this is here for. So then verse 7, uh, Revelation 10, 7, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Um, this might seem weird, because if you know right division, you know that Israel's program, we call that the prophecy program. And the way we get that is in Acts 3, Peter says in Acts 3, verse 21, Whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, 
which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So Israel's program is prophecy. It's the things that God has spoken by his prophets since the world began. And then for us in the dispensation of grace, if you go to Romans 16, we call that the mystery dispensation. So prophecy is associated with Israel. Mystery is associated with the body of Christ. And we get mystery from Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. So mystery was kept secret since the world began. Prophecy was spoken by the prophets since the world began. So when you're in Revelation 10 verse 7, it sounds weird that when the seventh angel began to sound, it says the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Well, if he declared it to his servants, the prophets, then it's not a mystery. But yet it is. So how is it both mystery and prophecy? Uh, the reason is there are some things in the prophets that are mysterious to them. Um, there are some things in the prophecy dispensation that they just don't understand. They're mysteries. When Jesus spoke in Matthew chapter 13, and I talked about this earlier, about the parables, why he's speaking in parables. He says in verse 11, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. It's the prophecy program, but then there are just some things that haven't yet been revealed. Uh, look over in Peter. Um, I'm going to say second Peter. Um, now first Peter. First Peter 1. In 1 Peter 1, um, and these, this Bible here, some of the pages are torn. I can't read it too well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring it up here on the screen so I can read it on the screen. 1 Peter 1. Um, 1 Peter 1, uh, look in verse 10. It says, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. So basically what it says is here's the prophets God has given, prophets mean, thus saith the Lord. God's giving the prophets some instructions, some things to write down. And he declared some things by the prophets. But the thing is, the details or the Holy Ghost there to give them the knowledge of what that is was a mystery. They looked diligently. The ones who wrote it down, it says, have inquired and searched diligently, searching what or what manner time the Spirit of Christ which is in them did signify. And then it was revealed to them that, it, that the, the, the specifics of what they wrote down, the understanding of the specifics, is not going to be revealed until the Holy Ghost is poured out in Acts chapter 2. And then they'll understand what was going on. So even though God had them write it down, it was still a mystery because they didn't have the understanding. So when you're in Revelation 10 verse 7, when it says the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Basically what it's saying is this, all this information um, about what God would do in the prophecy program is in the prophets. Daniel has end time information. But the thing is, it's still a mystery as to how until it actually happens, it's hard for you to understand even though he's written it down. Just like Jesus Christ is a good example. He told his disciples, I'm going to die, be buried, and raise again. But they didn't understand it. They didn't actually understand that until after it happened. And so basically what Revelation 10, 7 is saying, sure, the information is in the prophets, it's in prophecy, it's there, but until it actually happens, it's going to be hard for you to understand. Uh, so it's a mystery in terms of God not giving you the understanding but yet it's in the prophets, is what he's saying. 
So uh, Revelation 10, 7, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Basically meaning um, everything is going to be done in, in the prophecy program. And then verse 8, And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. Okay, this, it's interesting. It's not the angel who says this. It says it's the voice which I heard from heaven spake. Uh, I would imagine that's the, uh, the voice of God speaking. Um, and he tells him, so he tells John to take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel. So then verse 9, And I went into the angel. So he goes into basically Jesus Christ standing upon the earth and on the sea. One foot, or his right foot on the sea, left foot on the earth. And he's got this book um, from which probably the seven thunders uttered, you know, the, their voices. And then you've got all the things we've covered here. And so he went into the, I went into the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it, and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. So you may think, well, what in the world is that all about, and why is he eating a book? Um, if you go to Ezekiel chapter 2 as a cross-reference, because God had Ezekiel do the same thing uh, to the prophecies that Ezekiel was supposed to declare. So you look in Ezekiel 2... And look in verse 6. God speaks to him, And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions, be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. And thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house, Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. And when I looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without. And there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest, eat this roll, and go speak unto the house of Israel." And so I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat, and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. And he said unto me, Son of man, go get thee into the house of Israel, and speak with my words unto them. Um, so very similar. So he takes um, words that God had given him. It was in a book. He ate the book, and it was sweet in his mouth. And the purpose of it, we saw in Ezekiel 2.10, what was written on the book was uh, lamentations, mourning, and woe. It was written within and without. So these are all the punishments that God's bringing upon Israel for uh, their unbelief of God. And when he eats it, it's in his mouth honey for sweetness. And then he's supposed to go into the house of Israel and speak those words unto them. So in Revelation 10, when John says to the angel, give me the little book, and he takes it and eats it up, um, it makes his belly bitter and in his mouth sweet as honey. And then verse 10, and I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, thou must prophesy again, before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So we saw Ezekiel, God gave him words in a book. He said, eat the book, it's going to be sweet in your mouth, but bitter. Oh, well, he didn't say bitter there. He just says sweet in your mouth. He eats it, and then he tells him, go to the house of Israel and speak my words unto them. John does a very similar thing. He takes the book, he eats it, it's sweet as honey in his mouth. And then God tells him to prophesy before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Uh, so really what he's doing then is he's eating the book is just showing that 
the Word of God is being internalized into him. It's, it's just a symbol that now the Word of God is within him, so now he can go speak it. And that Word of God is it's sweet in his honey, as in his mouth, it's as sweet as honey, uh, because it's God's Word. God's Word is holy, just, and good. There's no impurities, there's nothing wrong with it, so it's going to be sweet to the taste. But um, the reason his belly is bitter is because it's like Ezekiel. When he, the book he ate was written there in Lamentations and Mourning and Woe. Uh, you may ask what the little book is that um, John eats. Uh, my guess is that it's the book in Revelation 5 because the book that Ezekiel writ, ate was written uh, within and without, you know, on the covers and inside. And it was Lamentations, Mourning, and Woe. Well, there's a book in Revelation 5 which is the book of the judgments. It has a... And verse 1, And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. So that's within and without, just like the book in Ezekiel. This is the seven seals. Well, contained within the seventh seal are the seven trumpet judgments. And contained within the seventh trumpet judgment are the seven vile judgments. So all 21 judgments that are in the book of Revelation for the tribulation period are actually contained within the seals, the seven seals. And so if it's a book of seven seals, it also contains the judgments of the trumpets and the vials. And so the little book um, probably is that. It's all of it. So it would be basically uh, the book of Revelation, but specifically the judgments of the seven seals, trumpets, and vials. And it's sweet as honey in his mouth, because all the words of the Lord are good, they're all pure. Um, let me get you a verse in the book of Psalms. Um, I'm going to look up the word honeycomb, um, because I know that's in there, and it's going to be easier than looking up swear, because I'm get, getting this one right. Uh, okay, uh, Psalm 19. Uh, look at this verse in Psalm 19. Okay, uh, verses, uh, verses 7 through 9 are, there are actually three sixes here in verses 7 through 9. Uh, so it goes, goes along with the uh, tribulation period. Uh, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Uh, the sixes are the law, the testimony, the statutes, the commandment, the fear, and the judgments. And then the three things is the law and perfect, converting the soul, that's three. Testimony is sure, making wise is simple, there's your three. Statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Um, I mention that just because the law of the Lord is what helps Israel through the tribulation period when the number of the beast is also 666. But all this together, the law, testimony, statutes, commandment, fear, judgments, they are true and righteous all together. Then verse 10, More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, and the honeycomb. So they're sweet because of what it does. It converts the soul. It makes wise the simple. It rejoices the heart. It enlightens the eyes. It endures forever. It's true and righteous altogether. Those are all very good things. And so when you eat the words of God, it's like sweet honey. But the problem is, in order to get to that, you've got to have the tearing down of your flesh, your pride, your sin, all the disgusting parts of your flesh is vile and God's word is pure. So when the pure word of God comes into your flesh, it's sweet at first, but eventually it makes your belly bitter. It makes your flesh sick. And in fact, it's going to kill your flesh so that you become alive in Christ. Um, so that's why when he eats the book, I believe it's referring to the words of the Lord in the book of Revelation, 
specifically the seven seals, uh, trumpets, and vile judgments. And it's sweet because it's the word of the Lord, but it's in his belly, it's bitter because of what it does to, to your flesh. It shows your flesh is vile. And so your flesh then tries to throw it up, basically get rid of it. And that's why they're killing people in the tribulation period, killing the saints. And then verse 11, it says, He said unto me, Thou must prophesy again. So that means he's going to take the words of this book. He's going to write them down. And you've got the book of Revelation here. Um, but he's going to also prophesy or speak them before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Now you may say, well, I thought that uh, this is for the nation of Israel. Why is it going to everybody? Well, that's because of where Israel is. Look over in Leviticus 26, according to the five cycles of chastisement. He says in Leviticus 26, 33, in that fifth cycle, which is what they're in in the tribulation period, and I will scatter you among the heathen and will draw out a sword after you and your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. So Israel... All Jews are not just in the nation of Israel. They're all over the place. And they know different languages. Get an example of that, you look over in Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost comes, the day of Pentecost, you have um, speaking in other tongues. Well, why? It says in verse 8, Acts 2, 8, the people say, How hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Uh, Parthenians, Medes, and the Elamites, dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and in Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and in the parts of Libya and Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Now, the reason these are all, you go up to verse 5, there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. So they're Jews, they're all Jews, but they're from all, every nation under heaven because they've been scattered among the nations due to the fifth cycle of chastisement. And so they, um, to reach Israel, you really have to go to all the nations. And so in, in Revelation 10, 11 says, He said unto me, Thou must prophesy again. Notice it says, it doesn't say, Thou must prophesy again unto or to many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. It says, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Before. Look over in Matthew 10, give an example. So when Israel is going to the lost sheep of the house of Israel in the tribulation period, and if the lost sheep of the house of Israel is scattered all over the world, then they are going to be arrested and they're going to be brought before other nations in order to testify to them the things of God. You see here in verse 17, Matthew 10, 17. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues, and ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. So although the prophecy of Revelation is for Israel, and it's only to Israel, Israel is under the fifth cycle of chastisement during the at-hand phase of the kingdom, and so they're scattered all throughout all the nations. And so in order to reach the lost sheep of the house of Israel, you're going to have believers in the tribulation period who are arrested and brought before various governors and kings. So that all, and so that in that way, all the Jews can hear the gospel of the kingdom. That's why Matthew 24, Matthew 24 says... And verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So although the gospel of the kingdom is really for the lost sheep of Israel, and it's re really reaching Israel, in order to reach all of Israel because they're scattered among the nations, the gospel has to be proclaimed in all nations. And so that's why Revelation 10, 11 says, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. They're going to have to go to all nations in order for all Jews to hear the gospel. Um, so basically, Revelation 10 is all about the little book. 
and its significance. And it's so important to understand that you wouldn't think all these trials and things would save people, but God tries things the easy way and man won't believe. So he has to try things the hard way, chastising them before they will believe. And uh, the fact that he speaks as the lion and the seven thunders and the one that's standing on earth and heaven who declares that time is going to be no more, uh, that shows his authority that this plan uh, of the book of Revelation, the refiner's fire of the tribulation period, will work for Israel to be saved. All right, that was chapter 10. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. We pray, we thank you that you've given us the Holy Spirit and we pray that we will allow the Holy Spirit to teach us the things of God so that others may be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. Help us to set aside our pride, to take the easy route, which is the simplicity that is in Christ, believing you in your word and just allowing Christ to live in us so that others, uh, so that your will is done and they won't even have to face this tribulation so they can be raptured up and be seated with you in heavenly places for all eternity. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, thanks for joining us. We're finished with Lesson 13 of School of Bible Believers, so we'll start Lesson 14 next time. We'll see you then.